for uh, quite some time, the history and history of Africa and the world has been curtailed to exclude the African man and woman from their rightful place on the world stage. The hidden history of African people is diligently becoming uh, known through the hard work of sisters and brothers like uh, the one I am going to introduce to you shortly. Um, it's coming to light now that many things that were once thought to be, you know, to originate in the hands of Europeans or Asians, in fact, uh, originated in the hands of African peoples. Uh, we can think of martial arts, uh, musical instruments, uh, architectural styles, you know, uh, many, many other things. But um, we learn that many figures from history also who were once thought to be European were actually of African descent. Um, but without the efforts of brothers like uh, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, we may have never rediscovered our roots and our history. Uh, Brother um, Kaz, you ready? So, yes, okay. yes, sir. Let's do this. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. You, know, you know I can jump on in. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Renoko Rashidi, are you on? Yes, I am. I'm on the line. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, please, uh, to, to the um, listening audience, uh, please welcome historian, research specialist, author, world traveler, and uh, public lecturer and teacher of African peoples all over the world, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Welcome to the Destroy and Rebuild radio show. Well, thank you for having me. That's an interesting title. Destroy and rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's where we destroy ignorance and uh, uh, black boots stomp out self hate, while we rebuild with intelligence and self respect. Well, with, good luck with that, because that's a uh, that's a <laughs> endeavor. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I, if if we we got to do it, you know, if, you, if we're challenged. Uh, with um, if you if you know something's wrong, you got to do something about it. So right, you, know. you can't just sit idly by and yeah. you know. If you don't mind my accent, how, how old are you all? Um, I'm 36. I'm 43. All right. Well, I'm 57. So uh -huh. I guess I don't know. If we're talking about different generations, but I'm just at a phase in my life where I think it's very important to know that the information, the work that I've done, and the work of people who've come before me, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, and others, that were passing it down in good hands. So you all give me a, a sense of pride and satisfaction that our future is secure as long as we have Africans like yourselves. I suppose the next question would be, what about the generation that come after you? Are they in good hands, and, and where are we at with that? Yes, indeed. I mean, when uh, that's our, uh, you know, that's our job is to make sure that they get that information and that they have the same um, exposures that we had uh, to, right. you know, the great historians and teachers and scholars that we had. So we have to make sure that they get that knowledge too. So yeah, but there's another dimension to it also. Yes, you have to make sure that they get that knowledge, but next to that. We have to be able to make it clear why this knowledge is important. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is maybe more difficult in some ways than just transmitting the knowledge itself. I always say that it's one thing not to know. It's another thing not to care. Wow. And that's very troublesome to me because so many people, young and old, African and otherwise, just don't seem to get why with high unemployment, with black people shooting each other down in the street, with all the terrible things that are going on in our community, health issues, et cetera, et cetera, why history and culture is important. And I don't hmm. think you can emphasize that enough. Doctor, if I may, um, in, my, in my own experiences, uh, you know, with some of the young brothers and sisters um, that I've spoken to on this matter, uh, one of the things that I find, <clears throat> excuse me again, in my own experience helps with that will be the fact that I can point to uh, certain things that they may know of. Uh, like mm -hmm. Chills mentioned, you know, some things about um, architecture. And um, I'll point out the Tekken, 
to them or, you know, what's known as the Washington Monument and others like it around the globe. I'll point to, uh, you know, certain uh, architecture uh, that's used on, you know, different known monuments and buildings uh, across the United States and, and, you know, the way different things are mapped out. Just as, you know, an example, and I will lead them into uh, where some of these things originated, where they came from, and why. And you right. know, the response I get from that is like, wow, I didn't know that. And, from, you know, right there, it's like you can look in their eyes and see, you know, that that, that light come on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, again, in my own experience, um, pointing out, you know, a few things, uh, you know, as that example, as I just laid out, it, you know, it does tend to help from time to time. Well, good. Good, good, good. That That's encouraging to me. What I try to do is I try to do very, very visual presentations. I try right. to do a lot of presentations, and I show lots and lots and lots of what I think are remarkable photographs. I think that we are, I may be a um, stereotypical thing to say, but I think that people, maybe black folk in particular, I don't know, tend to respond to visual stimuli. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. I travel around. I've been to 100 countries now. Wow. And I'm always taking pictures in museums, African communities, and what have you. Mm-hmm. So, I, so a wonderful thing that we do, and I just want to commend you all for the work that you're doing. I'm very proud of you, and I'm pleased to be on your show. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, I, I, I'm sure many of us have uh, learned much from your works um, over the years, as I have, and um, and you're always accessible and always uh, supplying needed information to uh, spark, you know, the thoughts in, in, in our minds of the people, um, be it on Facebook, um, the books you've written, um, uh, the lectures, uh, the presentations, as you say, um, the visual um, presentations as well, uh, um, the travel with Renoco updates that many of us get. Um, which leads to the question I often come up with in my conversations with many brothers and sisters that do the kind of valuable work that you do. Um, I'm always interested to know how did you come to discover the path that you walk? Oh, that's an easy one. I was um, a university freshman. I was given a, a extra credit assignment to go here, a man, who at that time was known as Stokely Carmichael, and it changed my life. Um, talked about Pan-Africanism, the need for young Africans uh, to get involved, to not be passive bystanders, that we can make a difference. So I joined the study group, and the first book we studied, and I mean studied, not just read or glanced through, was a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization. And that was a turning point because really for the first time, clearly, I came to understand that we had a history before slavery. That's a big deal. It may not sound significant to people listening, but I think even during, especially during this time of year, it's important to celebrate the African heritage. But don't start with slavery and don't end with slavery because it's my belief that if you think your history begins with slavery or colonialism and you teach from that perspective, that what, in fact, you are doing is conditioning uh, people to have the mentality of a slave or a colonial subject. So that was one thing. And then he mentioned emphatically in this book, Chancellor Williams did, that um, African people traveled around the world in ancient times, again before slavery. And even at that age, I was 18 years old, I knew then that I, my life's mission was set that I wanted to be a historian and that I wanted to follow in the footsteps of those Africans who left Africa a long time ago. I wanted to find out what became of them, those black people who went to India and China and Greece and Rome and Iraq and Iran and Australia and the Pacific and even the Americas before Columbus. And that's really what my life has become. I began as a student activist. I always liked to read. And then I actually began to, um, I worked at a college, Compton College, and I began to interact with the scholars like uh, Ivan Van Sertema first and foremost. And then at a certain point in time, I just decided 
that it wasn't enough for me to haunt the libraries and read the books, but that I wanted to travel and see the world. So one thing led to another, and now I can look back almost 40 years later and see these various stages and and basically see where I'm going to go from here. I've had a wonderful life. I've had mm. a wonderful life. I've done things that maybe nobody in history has ever done before. Mm. And um, But I'm an odd duck. I'm a different kettle of fish. <laughs> I absolutely must have intellectual stimulation. I love Africa. I love African people. I don't practice tribalism. Or I don't tolerate Africans from the continent who look down on African Americans. And I damn sure don't tolerate African Americans who do not have a positive vision of Africa. So you know, I have a life for the ages. But that's, in essence, how I got started, listening to Malcolm X, reading Marcus Garvey, Destruction of Black Civilization, and one thing led to another, and, and here I am on your show. <laughs> well, you you spoke to, you spoke about, of course, cl- uh, you worked closely uh, with the great ancestor, um, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, as well as uh, the great elder, Dr. Um, ben, as well. Um, could you speak on your experiences working with these brothers and uh, the influence that they had on you and maybe you had on them? Well... I don't know what influence I had on them. That would be, I don't know if I could even be bold enough to suggest that I had an influence on them, but they certainly had an influence on me. Um, Dr. Van Sertema, especially in the sense that Ivan, first of all, a lot of people may not know who Ivan is. Ivan Van Sertema, as you say, is an ancestor now. He was born in January 1935 in Guyana. Um, he came from a very mixed heritage, which had a profound influence on him, Native American, Dutch, African. He was raised to be an Uncle Tom. He was raised to be an accommodationist. And he had, like many of us, some profound influences as a young person. And when he was well, a mature man, I guess in his 40s maybe, maybe later than that, I don't know, living in London, um, you know, he was close to close to suicide. In mm. Europe, if you are not a part of the academy, you are really an outsider. It's different from the U.S. In the U.S., you can be an outsider and still, you know, um, make a big contribution. You can do a lot of things. But in Europe, class divisions are far more pronounced than they are here. So Ivan's mentor is a brother named Jan Carew, also from um, Guyana in South America. And Jan got Ivan a job two jobs at Princeton and Rutgers University. And this is about 1974 or so, maybe a little earlier. And Ivan uh, was exposed to a book by a Polish Jew, a book called Africa and the Discovery of America by a man named Leo Wiener. Mm. And that was Leo Wiener. Leo Wiener. W-I-N-E-R. Yeah, Wiener. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just like it sounds. And... Um, <laughs> And that changed everything. I, you know, we have certain points in our lives where I, what I call epiphanies, and that was Ivan's epiphany. So he spent basically the rest of his life dealing with what he was always to call his thesis. Mm-hmm. That is the African presence in pre-Columbian America. His big book, of course, is that came before Columbus. And then he mm-hmm. edited a series of publications uh, called the Journal of African Civilizations. So I met Ivan in 1981. I saw him lecture at uh, UCLA. I grew up in Southern California. And um, 1981, I also got a job at Compton Community College, and it was my job to bring scholars in to educate the African and Latino youth. And so Ivan and I began a relationship around that same time, 81, early 82. He asked me to write an essay for him, um, on Africans in ancient Iraq and Iran. And one wow. thing led to another, we developed a close relationship, and I was his best student in the sense that at least I was his most prolific student. I worked with him more than any other scholar, and we became friends. Certainly I learned a great deal from him, and I suppose what I learned the most, or the biggest thing, is the um, importance of being very analytical and being very meticulous um, <clears throat> In my, in my scholarship, not to take anything for granted, not to deal with the superficial, not just because a black person wrote something that that meant 
that I was not supposed to critically analyze it. Mm-hmm. With Dr. Ben, I guess um, the importance of popularizing African history, that African history wasn't just a thing for elites, but it was something that we should be able to communicate on a mass level. And, of course, Dr. Ben's great contribution also is now Valley Civilizations and actually taking people to Kemet. And I'll say one other thing, and I'll give it a pause. One of the big differences between Ivan and Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben, by the way, who's still living, um, Ivan was never much of a traveler. Ivan's big thing was the Olmec civilization, but to my knowledge, Ivan only went to Mexico two or three times, hmm. whereas with Dr. Ben, Egypt was like a, an annual thing, and I guess he's probably taking five, ten thousand people to Kemet. So there's a big distinction between those two brothers. Wow. Hmm. I just I wanted to say um, I, I have his book, uh, Dr. Sertiman's book. Um, they came before Columbus, and um, while I thought before I'd read it that I was aware of some things, that book, I have to say, was definitely an eye-opener for me on, on many different levels. And, it, you know, it was very deep to me. So, yeah. It, uh, well, Ivo is also a great writer. Dr. Ben is a very good writer. He <laughs> presents a lot of information in his book. But Ivan was a, was a brilliant writer and a brilliant orator. Ivan was yeah. the sort of person, maybe he just, has something to do with his British accent or something like that, or mm-hmm. his his manners. But he had a very captivating presence. So does Dr. Ben, but they're very different in that sense. And Dr. Ben and Ivan also have a kind of a love-hate relationship. Ivan was married to a European woman, mm-hmm. and Dr. Ben never ceased to give him grief over that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, clean in public now. That's one of the reasons right. that... Dr. Van Serman and I became close. Mm-hmm. Um, I think strongly that black men need to be with black women. I'm very, very, you know, strong on that. I would only be with a sister. Mm-hmm. But when I met Ivan, I knew he was married to an older uh, Eastern European woman. Mm-hmm. And I would, uh, you know, he gave me his home phone number. I would call him. This is before the Internet. And I would call and she would answer the phone, and I would always say, hello, Mrs. Fancer, how are you, how are the children, et cetera, et cetera. I was always very polite, and I was respectful. And I think the young brother Ivan really appreciated that. So our relationship grew and grew and grew. I think it was in 1982 or maybe 83 in Atlanta. We were on the elevator together, Ivan and I, and he says, Renoko, I want to do a trilogy of books. I want to do... um, one on the African presence in America. I want to do one on the African presence in Europe. And I want to do one on the African presence in Asia. And I want the Asian one to be first. And I don't know anything about Asia. So I want you to be the guest editor. And that would be another turning point. And that book yes. went through three editions. It's still a popular book. The African yes, presence. it is. Wow. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Now, you, you spoke about that. Now, your latest book is um, Black Star, the African Presence in Early uh, Europe. Can you shed a bit of light on that for the listeners? Well, this is a new book. Um came out in November of um, of last year, 2001, and um, it's a hot book. The only problem with the book, as I see it, is it's not widely distributed in the U.S. It's published by Books of uh, Africa, which is in London. So the book's expensive. I have to pay import duties and high shipping costs, but it's a very good book. I got um, one of Ivan's uh, foremost students, another brother, um, who's a great scholar, and that is um, Dr. Charles S. Finch, a medical doctor at Morehouse School of Medicine, hmm. wrote the foreword, and his focus was on the African presence in prehistoric America. And I got what I can, the brother I consider the foremost African scholar in the UK, a brother named Robert Walker, to write a preface. The work focuses on the African presence from the time of the Greeks and Romans up until, you know, African, men of African descent like Alexander Dumas, Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin in Russia. And then I capped it off by looking at African scholars like Jay Rogers, Edward Scobie, George Wells Parker, 
etc., who have documented the African presence in early Europe in a more, um, you know, in relatively recent times. So it's a nice book. I've now edited or authored 16 books, and it goes well with my work on the African presence in um, in Asia. God willing, by the end of this year, I have another four or five books that are published in 2012. So it seems like there's a season for everything, and my season for travel, you know, I've been to 100 countries now. My season for yeah. travel seems to be diminished a little bit, and it seems like it's a time for me to write and dissect and to analyze and to figure out what all of it has meant, what are the lessons that I can learn to give to our community. And so that begins to uh, take on the aspects of another one of our giants, and that is John Henry Clark. Mm, so I yes. find going through evolutionary phases, too, and now it just seems like it's a time to disseminate the information and to dissect it and just to try to figure out the value of it. So so you're, you're putting together four to five books this year? Wow. <laughs> um, four books with publishers right now. Wow. I have wow. the title thing. Put in French, another one on the African presence in Asia, a travel book. They will be published by Dagon Editions in Paris, an African publishing house in France. And then I have another book, which is a revised reprint of an earlier work. This one is called Introduction to the Study of African Classical Civilizations. That will be published in London by another African publishing house in the spring. Mm -hmm. These books are already done. And then I have another one that I still need to do some editing. And I'm, I can't seem to get around to it, which is called, I think the title is, Everywhere We Are, The Global mm -hmm. African Presence. And it will be my biggest book. And the publisher, uh, Black Classic Press in Baltimore, assures me it will be the best work I've ever done. So all of those uh -huh. books, God willing, will be published by the end of the year. Two French books will be out next month. And the one, uh, Introduction to the Study of African Civilizations, should be out in the spring. So, yeah, yeah that's looking that good. Last, that last you mentioned about um, the African global presence definitely Sounds very interesting to me. Okay. Well, that book takes on the dimensions of a, a travel book, but mm -hmm. also a semi -autobi autobiographical work. Mm -hmm. You know what I've seen, where I've been, you know the emotions of being with black people in India, being with the Batwa in the Congo, um, being with Aboriginal Australians, how I acted, how they treated me, what I can learn from that experience, and maybe the essence of it all is, what is an African anyway? What hmm. are the things that make us African? Are all black people Africans? Are all hmm. African black people? You know, can white people be ever be considered Africans? I try to address all of these fundamental issues, and whether I've, I've done it successfully, you all will be able to tell me, hopefully, within a few months. Hmm. That's may, I you, may I ask you one quick question? Because um, I'm quite sure Brother Chills has quite a few. What do you? Um, my fa one of my favorite authors has always been uh, Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop. Good. Um, what do you What do you think of um, the body of his work? Oh, Sheikh Anta Diop, in my opinion, is uh, the most brilliant scholar we've ever produced. There's no if and but about that. Okay. Okay. Especially when it comes to antiquity. When it comes to Nile Valley studies, I mean, we've had a lot of great scholars. We've already named a few, mm -hmm. but uh, Sheikh Hamza Job is in the uh, in the words the words uh, that we're using today is in the one percent. You know, he's the mm -hmm. guy. <laughs> and it's kind of sad in a sense that while we talk about Sheikh Hamza Job today, mm -hmm. and we talk about him in Senegal, he's you know just a brilliant scholar. Back when he was alive. You know, I'm almost inclined. I, I don't want to use it. I started to use some serious profanity. I speak the language <laughs> quite. He was really treated viciously in Senegal. I mean, he was under house arrest a great deal of the time. Mm. Now there's a university named after him, but that same university that's named after him today, Sheikh Anta Job University in Dakar, had a little ramshackle office with a couple of raggedy bookshelves way on the other side of the campus that was so dangerous at night wild animals would actually prowl there. And wow. so it's, and I want to emphasize this. A lot of us talk about 
how great we are when we are dead. I want y'all to give me some love when I'm here so I can Thank do you. something. But Sheikh Hunter Joke was awesome, one of the greatest scholars who ever lived. And um, I know his son, and Becky Diop, who lives in Paris, where I spend a great deal of time. And uh, a few months, about a year ago, I met his widow, a little French lady, little tiny lady, mm-hmm. who was a great scholar in her own right. So Sheikh mm-hmm. Hunter Joke has a legacy that would be very, very hard to top. In some ways, he's like a modern-day uh, Imhotep. Wow, that is yes. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll regress right there, but yes, I do agree, brother Jules. Um, no, I, what I wanted to ask is this question because a lot of times when when because we talk about history on here um, a lot, but um, some people say you know our children are struggling, uh, many are, you know killing each other. Um, how is history important? How? Will it help them? Sometimes they ask this question, but um, uh, please, yes. you know. Oh, go ahead. I'm here's, here's a simple answer. This is my philosophy of history, and I say this again and again and again. What you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself, and what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself, and what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So, if you are told 24/7 from cradle to grave that you come from nothing that you don't have a history or that your history begins in a jungle or with slavery or on a plantation, you'll act that out. And so it will come as no surprise when we shoot each other down in the street, when we knock each other in the head. You know, when the N-word and the B-word roll so easily off our tongues, when we have disrespect for the black woman, when your pants sag down to your ankles, if you are told you are nothing, this should not surprise anybody, but if you are told that you come from greatness, if you are told that you brought humanity to the world, culture to the world, civilization to the world, that you always resisted enslavement, that divinity, that royalty runs through your veins, you will act that out too. And that's what we must convey to our people, especially our young people, that you come from a great legacy, a great legacy that that is a part of our history and culture and tradition. And that is why this information is suppressed. That is why knowledge of who we are, whether it be ancient Egypt or the Moors in Spain or black dynasties in China, that is why that information is suppressed, because we were not brought here to be a free and liberated people. We were brought here to be a perpetual race of slaves, and it's up to us to break that down. Carter G. Woodson who we haven't talked about, is probably, I guess, properly credited with the advent of Black History Month, which began as Negro History Week, as you know, in 1926. And Dr. Woodson used to say, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. And that's the issue. Our thinking is controlled by people who do not have our best interest at heart. So it's up to us to break that psychological uh, chain. Mm. Wow. Yes, indeed. indeed. Well, I, if you just break it down, bro. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> now, now, let me just say this before we go any further. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm in Philadelphia now, and the major reason I'm in Philly, I'm going to do a series of presentations, but the first two major public presentations I want to let people know, I'm going to give a guided tour of the University of Pennsylvania Archaeology and Anthropology Museum. That's Saturday morning. I'm going to do it from an African perspective. I'm going to focus on the Nile Valley, but also Asia and ancient Europe. That's Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. A small donation. Children under 16 don't have to pay anything. And then on Saturday afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30, I'm going to do a very visual presentation called Who Are the Original People? African people as the aboriginal people of the world. That's going to be at the Songhai City Cultural Center at 3117 Master Street. The Songhai City Cultural Center at 3117 Master. And if people want information, if you want to go on the tour in the morning at the museum, if you want to come to the program in the afternoon, which we strongly encourage people to do, you can call area code 215 519 Seven seven four nine. That's two fifteen five nineteen seventy seven forty nine. I want people to be very much aware of that. 
so that not only can they hear this information over the radio, over the Internet, but they can also come out Saturday and I can meet them and greet them and show them some pictures. Definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure to be out there as well myself um, for uh, for if if not the first leg of it, the 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 um, second leg at uh, Song Gay Center. So yeah. I have you know I have to I have to come out there and uh, check you out. Um, what I wanted to get into is is I know your focus is I know you you spend a lot of time in in, in um, Asia. Um, would what are there any like you know what are some of the key uh points in history when it comes to asia when it, in 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 regards to african people well the key points in history in asia are the key points everywhere in the diaspora mm -hmm. first that african people left africa way some africans left africa way back in the day they migrated to the far corners of the earth, that African people are the aboriginal people of Asia, that African people, number two, played a fundamental role in the development of classical Asian civilization in India, in China, in Iraq, in Iran, in the Arabian Peninsula, in Southeast Asia. And then that African people are captured and enslaved and brought to Asia against their will. So these are the three great phases of the African presence in Asia. If we look at India, for example, we see more black people in India than any single country on earth. Mm -hmm. We see ancient African dynasties in China. We see in Japan the two proverbs that have been used to suggest an African presence. One says, for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of black blood. Another one says, to make a good samurai, half the blood in one's veins must be black. Black kingdoms in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, Cambodia especially, African blood that runs through the veins of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the first great civilization of West Asia, and that is uh, in southern Iraq, a civilization called Sumer, where the people call themselves the black-headed people. These are very, very important chapters of history. As a matter of fact, before I go any further, I think I can say with complete candor and honesty that most of the history of African people, especially outside of Africa, is yet to be written, that we have barely scratched the surface, and that the history of African people can only really be written by African people. Other people can make contributions, but ultimately, Black people are the ones who are responsible for writing the history of black people around the world. And Asia is a fascinating chapter, and for the most part, it is the chapter that, um, hey, we're still in the preface. We're still on the foreword. We haven't really gotten into the meat of the matter yet. So it's yeah. very exciting. It's very yeah. interesting that you, uh, just one real quick, Brother Jules, it's very interesting that you bring up uh, ancient Sumer, because for me, uh, and a lot of my research, especially, I'll say, oh, maybe four or five years ago, uh, I've kind of gotten out of it the past couple of years, but I would always focus on, um, you know, what we know today as ancient Sumer, even uh, ancient Sumeria, because once I became aware, I mean, everybody focuses on, you know, ancient Kemet, and, you know, that's a, that's a very beautiful thing. But uh, once I became aware that, that, were, that there was so much more, before that, um, again, speaking to Sumer and, you know, Mesopotamia and so on, uh, I found a great deal of information, you know, in terms of what you're speaking of, in terms of, uh, you know, the African presence in these lands and um, based on migration patterns and, and so on. So I still have quite a bit, you know, left to look into, but it's, it's good to know that, uh, you know, uh, brothers such as yourself are, are up, up on that because, a lot of times I felt like I was kind of, I don't know, spinning my wheels or something. You know, I kept hitting walls. But, you know, you just kind of inspired me to really look into that again. So I just want to... Well, well I, pre I appreciate that. But I don't want to take too much credit because <laughs> the things I'm, I'm learning as I grow is that as, the more you learn, the more you realize how little you actually know and how much there is to know. 
And it's a very, very humbling experience. I think that many of us, and I'm no exception to this, can become very arrogant with our little bit of knowledge. But over time, I think that changes, and you find yourself dwarfed by the immense um, the story that's out there, and even a bit amazed at how little we actually know about ourselves. Now, that's just Asia. Like, that's in fact, yeah. that's Iraq. <laughs> but think about all the other parts of the world. We've already talked a little, just a little bit about mm-hmm. Africans in Europe, African dynasties at the height of imperial Rome, Africans in Greek mythology like Memnon and Andromeda and Medea. <laughs> a little bit yes. about yeah. But yeah, we have yeah. mentioned anything about black people in Australia, the Pacific Islands. That's you know you talk about millions of black people who say. They come from Africa. Do you know that among Aboriginal Australians, there was a branch of the Garvey movement? Do you know that among Aboriginal Australians, there was a branch, that there was an Aboriginal Australian Black Panther Party? That's just <laughs> no. deep stuff now. Also, uh, Aboriginal Australians were not recognized by the government of Australia as human beings until January 1967. Let me repeat that. Wow. Until January 1967. Black people in Australia were regarded as plants and animals, as flora and fauna. It's deep oh, stuff wow. we're talking about here. Almost things that you find impossible to believe. Now, now there's there's two things that's interesting that, that you uh, spoke to. First, first, I want to make a comment. Well, comment question. I was actually surfing. Um, uh, you know the net. Sometimes you, you you get into it, and and I gave, came upon a um, Asian message board, and they were discussing the, uh, what you were speaking about with the uh, samurai with the black blood, um, and they at, basically scoffed at the idea. Like, mm, yeah. And yeah, have you run into this much, like in your travels, when you're, you know, have you lectured in front of some of the some, you know, maybe Asians or Europeans that off at some of the things you may say? Of course. <laughs> imagine, I would imagine some of them are scoffing, listening to what we're saying right now. And these are some of the people scoffing the most may not be black. I mean, may not be Asians or Europeans. They may be Africans themselves. If you are taught all the time that we don't have a history, that our history is, is about enslavement and co- colonialism, then any time you say things that, in, that Africa is the birthplace of humanity and human culture, and that Africans took that culture to the far corners of the earth, yeah, you're going to meet with a lot of opposition. I've lectured in 55 countries now, mm. and some of the audiences haven't been terribly friendly, but I've learned not to bite my tongue. I don't go into it all the time with a sense in the, in an attack mode. <laughs> I do a lot of times. Sometimes I put on my war face and I say, Low, you know, woe be to the person who gets in my way it tries to dispute what I'm trying to say. But I realize, too, that these old attitudes, these old ideas are firmly ingrained in people. Mm-hmm. And so it's difficult for some people to reconcile themselves, even when the evidence um, suggests exactly what I'm saying. i give you an example. About, uh, I guess it was 2010, I spoke at three big conferences, actually four big conferences in Africa, three in Nigeria and one in Senegal. And at a couple of these conferences, I was like the star. In Nigeria, I spoke, I was the keynote speaker, the first keynote speaker at the first ever Global Black Nationalities Conference. It was big, believe me. Mm. It was broadcast on TV and radio live all over Nigeria. It was big, and I was the first speaker. And then I did something similar to that in Senegal. I was actually introduced at this conference in Senegal by the president of Senegal, President Watt. And he he had to leave and go welcome a foreign head of state. And he came and says, Renoko, you come sit in my seat, and you be the chairperson of this conference. It was big. Hmm. I spoke at another conference in Nigeria, and there were a couple of white women, one from Mexico and one from Argentina. And I just made up my mind, I'm going to be friendly to everybody, no point in, in, you know, hating on folk. And so I'm talking to these people and everything is going well. 
all at once. Now, their thing, the one white woman from Mexico and the white woman from Argentina, their focus was on the enslavement experience. My argument is slavery is safe, especially if you are a victim. Now, on the other hand, if you talk about the slave, the enslaved African who dreamed night and day of cutting his master's throat, <laughs> of burning his master's house down, preferably with the master in it, that's a different kettle of fish. But as long as you are a victim, ain't nobody going to bother you too much. Now, I've been getting along with these women pretty well. We're staying in the same hotel. And then I showed pictures from the old Mac, these old Mac heads, these Africoid heads. These women, you could, if looks could kill, <laughs> we would have died that day. Their attitude was, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear about Ivan Van Sertima. We don't want to hear about Africans in ancient Mexico. We just ain't going for that. All <laughs> rational, all logic, all objectivity went right out the window. And I find that is not unusual, that uh, people cling to these old ideas, brother, and they're not going to give up on these ideas without a fight. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's one of the reasons well, we've decided that we're going to put more emphasis on the youth. We're going to try to mold minds and not just, not just destroy people. I mean, I, I believe <laughs> in, in destruction of things that are screwed up anyway, but hopefully we can reach some people who haven't closed their minds like they closed a window or a door for fear that a new idea might roll in. Wow. But you know what I find most interesting and what I take away from, you know, everything you've just, just said is that, you know, I find that a few of us, you know, in the so-called conscious uh, community, um, we'll, sit a, we'll sit here on the one hand and say, you know, we realize we are the original man. Yet, again, when, we, you know, some of the same brothers and sisters who say that when we're faced with the realization of how, you know, our ancestors migrated out of Africa and settled all over the globe um, and were the progenitors of, man, I mean, so much. It's, it's, it's almost like they can't grasp it. Yeah, it's like, is it too much? Is it flying over your head now? I mean, you, did you get what that saying in and of itself means? It, it's so simple and it's so profound at the same time. The original man. Yes. You know, it's easy to say, but in, in this, I think it goes to what you were speaking to earlier uh, in your introduction on the show tonight. It's easy to say, but are you really grasping what all that entails? You know, mm -hmm. and... and I think sometimes uh, some of us, we kind of get caught up in that, you know, in our, you know, so-called, you know, quote-unquote pro-blackness. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll shut up there, but yeah. No, you don't ever have to shut up. You know, the only <laughs> black is the one you don't ask. I appreciate the dialogue. Let me say this. Mm -hmm. I mentioned with some degree of pride mm -hmm. that I've lectured in 55 different countries. I've lectured on every continent in the world except Antarctica. And if I can find some black people down there, I'm going down. Uh, I hear you. I hear you know, it's not going to be friendly. Everybody's not going to be receptive in Australia, Asia, Europe, you name it. Mm. So that a lot of times, just to engage the audience, I start by asking people, what do you think of when you think of Africa? Let's just get right down to basics. Mm. You know, don't think about it real deep. Just give me your gut reaction. When I ask you, what do you think of when you think of Africa, what comes to mind? And I get three answers very consistently. Well, that is, first and foremost, it never fails, wild animals. Mm. Number two, generally, poverty and disease. Mm. Or number three, well, that's it. Wild animals, one, poverty and disease. Wow. And so I begin to say, do you know Africa is where the first people came from? Africa is where people first stood on two feet. Mm -hmm. Africa is where people first wore shoes, had a house, rode a boat. Africa is where people first wrote, where they first had language, where, the, where they first had a book. Africa is where people first charted the stars in the heavens, had philosophy and morality and religion. Mm -hmm. Africa is where people first counted. 
Africa is where people first played music. Africa is where people first buried the dead, on and on and on. And then people begin to say, well, maybe Africa isn't so bad after all, because that's what it's about, you see. Yeah. History for us cannot just be about facts and dates and figures. It must have substance. It must have life. And it must clarify our sense of identity and give us a sense of pride and being African people. One of the greatest scholars we've ever had, who was also a dear friend of mine, he's an ancestor now, named Aza Hilliard. Mm-hmm. And Baba Aza used to say, to be African or not to be. So history can give us a clear sense of identity and who we are. It's kind of hard to organize a team to fight if there's no clear sense of identity and who we are. And so African history clarifies all of those things. So I know a lot of people are saying Black History Month is old. We've got we've gotten beyond that. I think we should be celebrating our history, clarifying our history, presenting our history 366 days a year. We can never do it enough. Mm-hmm. And Black History Month is a time when we can, you know, get official sanction <laughs> to emphasize that. <laughs> But we have to identify the parameters. We're not yeah. going to start with slavery. We're not going to end with slavery. We're going to begin with Africa. We're going to end with Africa. And we're going to talk about resistance to enslavement in the middle. Hmm. See, we spoke to that on last night's show uh, to a certain degree in that, you know, it seems as if, you know, we get, well, some of us get caught up in when we think about our history and we get this one month out of the year here. Uh, you know, it seems like our thinking doesn't go back any further than than slavery here. But it, you know, and, and that's a shame that it's that way. And I'll close off my comment in saying that um, I remember a few years back on some ABC News primetime show, um, and dude was white. Uh, he was not American. I do remember that much, but he was an archaeologist slash biologist. But on ABC News primetime program, this man sat there and stood there in front of everyone on the podium and said, based on all of his years of research and study, that the blood of everyone, everyone, should have a drop of black blood in it. Well, that's true. I, I remember turning... Because I was I was over my you know my mother's house and I said to her, I said, damn, I'm surprised a that dude was able to say that and b if he survives much past that night. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, well, unfortunately or fortunately, white people are descendants of Africa too. <laughs> you know, white people are <laughs> the mutated offspring of those Africans who left Africa and went into Europe a long time ago. In a sense, you could say white people are our children, Mm. and they need a big spanking. They need to be (laughs) out of hand. What did did, uh, Dr. Carruthers uh, say? He said that they owe a blood debt. (laughs) Yes, they do. We have to put ourselves in a position where we can collect that debt. It's, to me, it's the same thing with reparation. Yeah. Right. White never going to give us reparations because it's morally the right thing to do. It will only respond to a big stick, and African people have to develop a stick because that's what Europeans respond to. They do not respond to morality for the most part. And African, and, and again, history and I'm going to wind it up with you all. I'm sure you have other things you want to discuss on your show. But ultimately, it's about empowerment. That, to me, is why history is important. It's a tool to empower our people. It lays a foundation for everything that we do. As I said at the beginning, what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. What you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. I'm in Philly now. I just mentioned that. I'm going to do these programs on Saturday. And the brother who picked me up from the train station today, coming from New York, mm-hmm. and drove me to my hotel, we passed by uh, what I didn't know existed in Philly, and that's a Jewish museum. Very wow, interesting. Yeah. 
And it seems to me that the Jews are a very interesting example of people who never let you forget what happened to them. There's not a day that goes by. There's not something about the Holocaust, a movie, a documentary, a book, a new, or something or another. But those very same people tell you, you, first of all, you can't tell them that the Holocaust was a long time ago. But those very people and others will tell you that our history was a long time ago or that our history is irrelevant, that it doesn't matter. Even in the darkest days of the Holocaust, when the Jews were being shipped from the ghettos of Eastern Europe to Auschwitz-Birkenau and Bergen-Belts and those concentration camps, those death camps, yes, Jews sir. were writing histories. They were writing diaries as if to say, even if we physically perish from the earth, we will survive because our history will survive. I would love for Africans to take up a similar kind of mentality. You know, there are so few Jews in prison that there are no statistics for it. Wow. I would say that there is a direct correlation between people who emphasize or between folk who emphasize their history and the status of those people in the world. People who emphasize their history tend to rise to the top. People who de-emphasize their history are generally on the bottom, and that's one of the sad things, that wherever black people are in the world today, it's always just about in Asia, mm -hmm. in Australia, in the Pacific Islands, North, South, Central America, the Caribbean, and I'm sad to say, even in Africa, black people, for the most part, do not control the motherland, especially the economy. Mm -hmm. The economy in West Africa are controlled by Arabs, and mm -hmm. East Africa is controlled by Indians. So in South Africa, it's the same thing. And I would argue that the, one of the major contributing factors for that is that we do not engage, we do not engage in an unrelenting um, uh, propaganda campaign about our history as a people, and we suffer from that. So and, you and, you, and, you, and you see the, you see the effect, and especially with uh, Europeans, because uh, you see Europeans always promote their history. Uh, no, and I don't that. I ain't mad at them for that. I'm and mad at them. No. Yeah. Well, and the same that. with Asians. And the same with Asians. If you see, and if you look at the, the so-called hierarchy, you see, um, you see Asians do the same thing. Their culture is is entwined with everything they do. Like um, their history. Like you can watch one of their cartoons or something. It'll have something to do with their history. Some somehow. So it's. <laughs> yeah, I, I I feel that that's. That's on point. That's so they don't apologize for it. They don't yeah, stutter and they don't stammer and they don't apologize. They're straight up about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, again, you can there's a correlation between people who emphasize their history and their status in the world. So, again, I just want to remind the listeners, especially for folk who may have just tuned in, that I'm in Philadelphia. I'm going to do two big programs on Saturday. The first will be at the University of Pennsylvania Archaeology and Anthropology Museum. I'm going to give a guided tour and a lecture. That's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, the address is 3260 South Street in Philly. And then in the afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30, I'm going to do a slide presentation lecture called Who Are the Original People? I'm going to throw down. I'm going to show some of my best pictures of black people around the world to focus on the African people as the Aboriginal people of the of the world. That's going to be at the Songhai City Cultural Center, and that's at 3117 Master Street in Philadelphia. Uh, there's a small donation in each case, and if you want further information, if you want to come to the museum lecture, uh, if you you know need information about the afternoon lecture, please call area code two one five five one nine. Seven seven four nine. That's two one five five one nine seventy seven forty nine. And if you are very very bored and have <laughs> nothing in your life to do, you want to reach out and email Renoko Rashidi. You can email the brother at Renoko at hotmail dot com or Renoko at yahoo dot com. And brother Renoko, my <laughs> name is spelled R U N O K O. And, again, it's either yahoo.com or hotmail.com. May, may I ask real quick, uh, Doctor, you mentioned um, pressing, you know, our, our history. Uh, and 
and I have to use the word, you know, I know it's usually used in a negative context, but our, you know, pressing our own agenda. Um, what do you think will be the best way to, to, to accomplish something like that, to, you know, get things to a level, to a national, nationally televised level, um, to get some of our best scholars, some of our best teachers, our best historians, archaeologists together to, um, bring all this information to bear uh, upon everyone to see. What, what do you think uh, would be some of the you know best ways to do that, to your mind? I think that what you all are doing is a part of it. Okay. I think uh, I'm from the Malcolm X School of Thought by any means necessary. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm a historian. I'm going to present this information. I'm going to show a lot of pictures. But what you all are doing with Internet Radio AM, FM radio, hip hop, movies, you know, um, whatever, by any means that we have available in the school system, putting pressure on the schools in our community to have a more of an African centered approach, putting pressure on the pastors in our community to incorporate this information in Sunday school you know, to send this information to that army of African men and increasingly African women who are incarcerated in the United States in prison. You know, so there's not any one thing. I think that everybody has a different mission. The missions are not the same, but they're intertwined. And I think we all, in our own individual and collective ways, have to do what we can, have to be creative, have to be productive, and we have to have the attitude that what we do makes a difference. We cannot be passive bystanders on the stage of history. If I had a criticism of my people, and after being in the movement for 40 years, you've earned the right to be critical, I think that we have to have a messiah complex, that we're waiting on a Harriet Tubman, a Marcus Garvey, a Malcolm X, a Fane Lou Hamer, a Barack Obama, a Jesus, <laughs> to come and grab us by the hand and say, liberation is over there. I think that if we just looked at ourselves in the mirror every day and asked ourselves concretely and specifically, what am I doing to advance the cause of my people, we could turn this thing around right quick. So there's no easy solution. We all have a mission. We can sit. We can brainstorm. We can talk. But we must believe. That True. we are capable of making a change. We must believe that what we do matters and that nobody's going to save us but us. If we have that mentality, you know, I think that's 99% of the battle. But, you know, one of the things we always run into, and I'm quite sure you can attest to this, is that, you know, those of us who who, who do try to, to uh, step up, uh, one of the, you know, I'm not saying it, you know, uh, that it should stop us, but one of the first things that we have to deal with in that mentality is, well, who do you think you are? And you think you, be, I mean, you know what I mean? And it's like, uh, no, exactly huh? what you. <laughs> are you going to get that from your family? <laughs> right. <laughs> get it from your wife, from your husband, from your children, from your parents, from your colleagues at work. You're going to run into opposition now. And nobody, yeah. nobody said it's going to be easy. But think about what Malcolm went through. Think about what yeah. Martin went through. And that's the price you pay. price of freedom is, it comes at a big price. Yeah. But, you know, once you know these things, then what you're going to do? And that's why I think a lot of people turn off to history. Because with knowledge comes responsibility. Yes. Once you have to know. You know, an ancient chemist, in ancient Egypt, they used to say ignorance is evil. I love that. Now they tell you ignorance is bliss. Bliss meaning uh, happiness and contentment and joy. A lot of people don't want to know because with knowledge comes responsibility. But those of us who know must act. It's not enough to have that. Now, I want to really emphasize this. It's not enough just to have the information. If you aren't going to do anything with it, then it really doesn't have a whole lot of value you got to do something with it. Kwame Nkrumah used to say, thought without practice is empty, and action without thought is blind. True words have never been spoken. Thought without practice is empty, and mm -hmm. action without thought is blind. It's not enough to know that we built the pyramids. Yeah. But 
so not a, you can't ignore that. So we have to combine thinking with action. Creative action with positive thinking will take us a long way. So mm. I guess so that's my message for tonight. <laughs> I, I tell Brother Chills, you know, we talk about this all the time. And, yeah. and, and, you know, I have a little saying, sometimes you have to be the bad guy. And I use yeah. that in the context of what we're speaking of. And, and I've learned, um, especially these past couple of years, that if I have to be the bad guy, you know, the perceived bad guy, if you will, then you know what? I'll embrace that. I have no problem with that. Um, <laughs> now, I, I, you know, it ain't a- easy. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> but if I have to, <laughs> I will. And, and, well, there's a price we must pay, but I will right. say this. There will come a time, I think, mm-hmm. that I'm going to face John Henry Clark, and I'm going to face Ivan Van Sertum and A.V. Hilliard, and I'm going to face all those shake on Joe and Jay Rogers and all of those great scholars who have come before. Mm-hmm. And they're going to ask me, Brother Renoko, what did you do to advance the cause of African people? And I think I will be able to raise my head and look them in the eye and say, here is my record. I followed in your footsteps. I did the best I could. I made many sacrifices. Mm. Sometimes I questioned myself and I questioned us, Mm. but I did the best I could. And I think they will say, Brother Renoko, well done. Welcome. And that gives me a degree of comfort right there. Yes, sir. Now, now, talking this in. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, indeed. Now I, I don't know how long we have you on for tonight, uh uh it's Doctor. Just, time is just about gone, my brother. So. Yes indeed. I, I have another six hundred questions for you. You sure you <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 